I'm going to be talking about something totally different, though. This is a brand new bridge, and it's something that we are building for 100 years minimum. So hopefully some of the things that we're going over here will, will show how we're going to manage to get a 100-year uh, bridge across the St. Croix uh, River. Uh, the St. Croix River crossing is over the St. Croix River. It's a border between Minnesota and Wisconsin uh, near the town of Stillwater and Oak Park Heights. In, in Minnesota and a little town of Holton in Wisconsin. Uh, the project is five years in duration. Paul mentioned in four years he did 50 bridges. It's taken me five years and I'm still completing one. So, <laughs> But at any rate, it's been a, a fabulous project and we'll go over some of the specifics. There was two different contracts on this. Uh, there was an early foundation contract for $37 million. There was a superstructure contract for $332 million, so a total about $375 or $80 million worth of bridge. It's an extrados bridge or extradost, and it's a combination of a box girder bridge with a cable stay. And it's uh, been constructed overseas a fair number of times, the first used in 1988 in France, constructed in Japan in 1994, and many, many since then, about 100 worldwide at the start of our project. But this was the second major highway bridge, Extrados Bridge in the United States, the first one being the, the Q Bridge in Connecticut. So it's fairly new to North America, but it was selected to address some specific site concerns uh, mainly the aesthetics. We didn't uh, want to have big, huge towers like a cable stay would, would have, but we still wanted to have some long span lengths and fit within the, the scenic river uh, area. So here's a view of uh, uh, artist rendering, and you will see from some of the pictures as we go on that uh, indeed we, we constructed it much like, like this. It's 600 foot spans in the river. A lot of the presentation will be on the, the river spans, uh, 600 feet between each of the piers. Uh, obviously, the piers are a, a huge component of, of bridges, of major bridges, as well as the smaller ones. In the St. Croix River, there's five of our foundations that were in the St. Croix River. The foundations are on drilled shafts. There's nine foot diameter drilled shafts, uh, four of them under each footing. So the, the pier in the upper left photo, uh, there's two columns for every pier. There's two uh, footing under each of those columns. So in total, we had 40 drilled shafts, nine feet in diameter, roughly 125 feet deep. So the, the drilled shafts went down through 20 feet of water, about 80 feet of soft soils, mud, and so forth, uh, hit the, the solid granular, and then 25 feet into bedrock. But then the loads from the, the superstructure. So box girders, it's side-by-side -side box girders are framing into the, what we call a cross beam. Now the cross beam is taking the loads then uh, down into the pier blades and down the pier blades into the foundations. Now the cross beams are massive. There's about 1,100 cubic yards of concrete in each one of the, the five cross beams. And so here's some pictures of, of some of the rebar and some of the forming that's going on. Uh, uh, the false work uh, in its own right was a massive amount of uh, structural steel on the project. We can see some of the epoxy coated bars, the green bars here. I think actually the next picture will show in the cross beam. <clears throat> we had a couple different uh, types of epoxy coatings. Uh, the standard green uh, coatings and then a purple uh, coating that's, I think it's used more on the, the west coast. Um, a little more durable in, in some of the in the sunlight, but it's, uh, <clears throat> this was not specified, but something that the rebar manufacturer came up with. Uh, there's a headed rebar, so the purple ones are, are for headed uh, reinforcement. It was, uh, there, there's so much reinforcement in there that it's hard to develop the, the rebar, and so we used headed rebars. Plus, this bridge being between Minnesota and Wisconsin, Got to throw in the old Packers and Vikings. We, we got both colors there inside of the bridge. So pretty interesting how you uh, construct a major river crossing. So out here in the, the middle of St. Croix, again, five piers out in the river. Uh, one pier was accessible by land, but all of the rest of them had to get the concrete out there on barges. 
We can see the uh, extensive use of, of pumper trucks to get concrete up to the level of the cross beam. Uh, the cross beams ranged in height from 100 to 150 feet above the, the water level, 150 feet on the Wisconsin side and, and uh, going downhill at a 1.7% grade uh, toward the Minnesota side. But concrete transport here it looks like some pretty inclement weather. And uh, the typical process used on the superstructure contract was the ready mix truck would, would uh, produce the concrete at a site about a plant about five miles away, drive to the site, put it into a pump truck, pump it into one of these uh, ready mix trucks that were uh, stationed uh, totally on the, the barge, and then it would shuttle the concrete out to the site, discharge into another pump, up into the work. Uh, we required that the contractor uh, provide concrete that would, would have workability for up to three hours. So 180 minutes was the requirement. They had to prove that uh, before the project and, and show that it, it would uh, remain workable for that uh, duration. Uh, concretes ranged in strength from 4,000 to 9,000 uh, PSI. Uh, some of the segments we'll get into it will, will be 9,000 uh, PSI. Uh, concrete. So the cross beam construction, uh, we're, we're also using what's called balanced cantilever uh, construction. So the white ducts up on the top are the way to, to put our post tensioning through. And balanced construction, uh, there'd be segment one to the left, segment one to the right. Uh, they'd get post tension together, then you go segment two and two, post tension them together. Each of those uh, post tensionings would go through one of those ducts. And so with 29 segments cantilever on each side, uh, that meant there was two tendons for each pair of, of segments. So there's 58 uh, different ducts running through each side of the beam. Once we got the cross beams done, the pier table is essentially the first cast in place segment. So here's a, a look at, at some of the work going on there. You can see all of the ducts that they had to work around, the reinforcement. Again, some pretty high strength uh, uh, concrete that, that goes on there. All of this had been supported by that false work that we had seen in one of the earlier pictures that then got lowered and to enable uh, the start of, of segment lifting. An Estrados bridge has uh, short towers. These towers were 67 feet above the bridge deck. A cable stay has a much steeper uh, angle of the stays. Stratos bridge is much flatter. In a way, it's functioning like internal post-tensioning. It has a, the same a basic concept. It has more of a, a horizontal force than a vertical component. And so we had to build the towers. So here's a couple of pictures of the towers going up. In the right picture, you can see an anchor box that's up on the top. I actually think there's another a picture of it. A massive elements. Here the right picture shows those tower anchor boxes. And uh, those are fabricated down in Florida, and they were trucked up on site. Uh, but each, each one was about 10 feet tall, uh, four of them stacked together, uh, one on top of each other, bolted uh, together. And those, what was like, accepting the, the stay cable up in the pylon. And the stay cables go from the deck level up into the pylon and anchor there. They do not run continuous uh, through the pylon. So here's a little view of the pier tower with all eight a stay cable, so there's eight coming off each direction of, of each pylon, so there's 160 uh, stay cables. Uh, the approach bridges are pretty interesting in their own right. Uh, cast in place concrete boxes uh, can be pretty straightforward and they can be pretty complex. Th these ones are pretty complex. There was uh, geometry uh, varied. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, an off ramp heading off to the upper right or uh, on the, the Heading to the right, uh, on the bottom part, the left part of the picture is an on-ramp. That means the geometry has to change in that center portion of the bridge. And uh, so it is uh, cast in place on false work. There's two different uh, bridges, uh, eastbound and, and westbound, as depicted here in the orange and the blue. Uh, the, the approach from the abutment out to the, the center portion where it really widens out was also precast and, and done again in balanced cantilever fashion. So here's some of the approach bridge uh, erection. So Pier 1 is uh, adjacent to our uh, Highway 95. We see the pier segment 
uh, up there in place and starting to, to fasten the other segments. The casting yard was just off of the uh, west abutment, and so the lower right picture shows transporting one of those segments from the casting yard to the site. Uh, it, these segments, I think I have a slide on it, were 90 tons in, in weight, and they were ranging from 10 to 14 feet in depth. Uh, again, balanced cantilever type of construction, you're, you're constructing one off to the left, one off to the right. There were closure alignments that were made uh, so that we make sure that the geometry goes in the correct uh, location that it is intended. So here's a picture, uh, on the left picture, the very left part of it, a crane is holding a segment. Uh, that segment gets uh, held up into place. There's an epoxy that gets uh, fastened onto each face. They get pulled together with the temporary post-tensioning bars. And after the temporary PT is up and, and it's a twin segment on the other side of the pier, then there's a post-tensioning tendons that get stressed. But we can see the relatively long cantilevers that happen. The, the picture on the right, we've been in balanced cantilever, and I don't remember the exact uh, cantilever length there, but probably around uh, almost 150 feet uh, coming out on, in that, that direction. Uh, always check in geometry uh, to make sure that we are heading off in the, the correct direction. Here's a rendering of, of Highway 95 under the, the, under the bridge, and indeed we turned out to be uh, in much that, that same, um, same configuration. But so the casting yard, I mentioned that uh, we had a casting yard just off the west abutment, so in the background there you can see the river, you can see some of the bridge that's already been constructed. Uh, there was three different casting beds. The yellow forms are casting beds, and we, were cast, we cast 342 segments in that approach casting bed. And we cast, it took about uh, two years from July 2014 until we finished up in July 2016. Uh, finished erecting the segments then by about uh, August or, or September of, of 2016. The uh, segment dimensions, there you see the numbers, uh, 10 to 14 feet tall, 10 feet long, and up to about 90 tons each. Segment lifters to position these things from the, both the casting bed to its position in the yard and then from the yard onto that transporter we saw a picture of earlier. Uh, these big uh, lifters can be used for lifting boats and all kinds of stuff, but in this case, they were uh, purpose to, to do the segments. Uh, for the main span, the main span uh, on the river, Again, there's five uh, river spans plus uh, the last span, 14, over the Wisconsin Bluff. It takes 650 segments altogether. The, the contractor opted to use a, a facility here. It's a, an aggregate mining facility by Aggregate Industries. Uh, so it's a very large operation. You can see a lot of the barges in this picture. Uh, they are loaded with aggregate and then shipped off to wherever for making concrete and roadbeds and all kinds of stuff, so uh, they, they made a, a segment casting facility that was in a, a building 600 by 100 feet. There was five different casting beds in there, <clears throat> and they were cast, again, for over about a two-year process from September of 2014 on to August of, of 2016. So how did those segments get to the site? Uh, they were barged along the Mississippi and the St. Croix Rivers. So a good picture here of, uh, they, they transported typically from eight to 12 segments on any one barge. Uh, there was a lot of restrictions, even environmentally, the barges could not leave the St. Croix after they had been de decontaminated from zebra mussels for more than 96 hours. But the barge would come, pick up segments, and back it would go. It was a, roughly a six to eight hour ride on the barge for those 33 river miles. So now talking a little bit about getting the, the unit three segments up into place. The segment lifters are the, the blue pieces of equipment that ultimately go and sit on top of the bridge and they will advance as the bridge goes, uh, a segment gets, um, gets moved out one after another, this blue segment lifter would follow that work. And so here we see them starting to be installed, first uh, transported to the site, installed, and, and then they were used to erect the segments. In 2016, the contractor also 
uh, brought in a couple extra pieces of equipment. They were running behind on their schedule, and they brought in two of these huge ringer cranes. Uh, the segments were 180 tons. These, these cranes were capable of lifting up to 600 or 660 tons. And so they're massive. The, the, little, the picture on the right shows uh, they had to build a little uh, docking, dock wall, coffer cell, uh, fill it up and put that ringer crane on board there uh, to lift the segments for that last span 14 up toward the abutment over the Wisconsin Bluff. So to track all the alignment when you're casting these segments, they're, they're precisely surveying. They have a series of marks that go on the segments, and, and you, if you need to make a turn, you, you rotate the segment slightly. On the main span, we're a straight line, so it should have been easy, just follow it one after another, uh, but it takes precise surveying. So to the nearest thousandth of a foot, uh, by the end of the day, we ended up having to shim a little bit, and we had some wet joints that had to be put in uh, to, to arrange the segments to get back on line, but end of the day, we were within about an inch and a half uh, vertically and horizontally, so that the remainder we could take up with uh, a little bit of jacking, pulling them together. So erection on the river is coming along uh, with these segment erection <coughs> uh, lifters. Uh, the segments had to also be transported uh, from the river side to the land side on piers 8 and 12. So that's a little picture of that. Here's some segments moving up getting up uh, into, the, into the work. I mentioned the segment epoxy. There's a crew of probably eight or so guys uh, doing epoxy. I often said, I'm glad I'm not the guy down below because these guys aren't exactly perfect with their, their movement and some epoxy's dripping down. Temporary post-tensioning bars uh, get installed. Now the post-tensioning to tie the segments together from segment 10 on the left to 10 on the right, there's uh, 25 different strands that are going through. And so that's the, the typical method that works out there. I mentioned there's two segments side by side. There's also a, a longitudinal closure link, uh, pretty highly uh, congested with rebar. There's transverse ducts that have to be uh, installed with, with some post-tensioning going through there, you see in the white. So that's all things that, that do need to, need to happen. Uh, transverse struts, uh, there, there's a drape PT tendon that goes down uh, through the strut and anchors at the stay cable. The stay cables themselves, uh, they're 10 inch diameter. Here we can see the first one going up, uh, and more of them going up, and I have a couple pictures of installing. So there's uh, individual uh, strands, and there's 76 of them in one 10 inch diameter cable. And they are stripped at the end, they're stressed. They come up, here's in, inside the anchor box to show a picture of up inside uh, the anchor box, and here's a, a view of, of some of those cables inside there. Uh, each one of those is tensioned to about 33,000 pounds of force. Uh, these are replaceable, so it's talking bridge preservation. Uh, we do have the ability at any time to go in and take out a cable and put another one in. The bridge has been designed uh, to accommodate that. So nice view down the cables and looking at some of the other uh, work in the background. Uh, other kind of complex work, it's a more a finishing thing, it's, it's putting a deck skirting on there to protect the stay cables and also to, uh, to provide a more uniform aesthetic look. And so, th so that is shown uh, here. Uh, overlooks, uh, there's a 12 foot pedestrian trail, pedestrian bicycle trail on the bridge and there's also at uh, three of the piers over the river an ability to get off and enjoy the scenery, um, and so here's a, a view of, of that. Uh, to uh, construct Pier 13 over the Wisconsin Bluff, it's very, very scenic, also highly erodible soils. They ended up using uh, this trestle uh, to do that work. Segments were lifted uh, by that crane I showed earlier, so kind of the top portion of the picture. Segment would follow the red line and uh, get uh, put into place. So that is uh, span 14. The closure pours, so it's, it's all, always critical in a cantilever. We're standing out here, we got 300 foot uh, balanced cantilever, 300 foot cantilever each side. We close it up with a little two and a half foot closure pour. Things are jacked apart to get the proper stresses in. And uh, so that happened over the, the winter, this past winter, December to, uh, to February. 
So some of the other things for preservation, modular expansion joints, we have up to 39 inches of, of movement. Uh, these joints were provided by Watson Bowman. Uh, the epoxy chip seal overlay was done by Truesdale. Uh, early in the design, we, we had no overlay whatsoever, and, and some of us said, we need some way to protect this deck. We're going to get 100 years. We need to protect it, and so we opted with a, a 3 8 inch uh, epoxy chip seal overlay. Uh, the trail shown here, again, has an epoxy chip seal. There's some lighting and so forth that uh, works on there. Concrete surface finish is a single component, a text coat product, which we've been uh, using a lot in this state. It, it was both roller applied and spray applied. A couple of photos shown there. A bridge deck drainage was done by Aptus. And uh, all of the water that falls on the deck comes into the drainage system. There's nothing that uh, goes down into the river itself. Uh, we had some slope stabilization on the Wisconsin side. Here's a, a, a photo of, of some of that, just to make sure that that highly erodible slope doesn't get away from us and then bridge preservation items. So in the future, again, we, we hope this is a 100-year bridge. I don't uh, think I'm gonna be around to verify that, but uh, certainly the safety inspections, we had a safety inspection at the uh, end of construction. Obviously, we'll be looking at expansion joints, at bearings, uh, chip seal, any leakage in the, in the bridge, uh, stay cable replacement, uh, drainage, and lighting. So. So the things, it's, uh, it was absolutely a fabulous project to be involved with. On the closure report between the segments, uh, is there load transfer happening there? Like, I mean, the things are kind of, I presume, leaning further and further down because it's all cantilevered. What's the mechanics of that at that port? Yeah, so the question is, is there a load transfer at the closure pores? So at the closure pores, we jack them apart. So it puts kind of a compressive force in. Uh, when the concrete then is poured, the jacks are released, it puts a, a compressive force back in. So, so there's, uh, part of the calculation there is to, to look at concrete creep and shrinkage. So over time that concrete is going to shrink on itself a little bit, so we need to make sure there's enough force to overcome that and to enable that the piers themselves are, are able to, to flex. So yes, there is some. So, so what specifically did you do to make this last 100 years on this bridge? Good question. What did we do to make this last 100 years? So uh, I didn't mention stainless steel, but we have a lot of stainless steel rebar in the deck. Uh, we have the epoxy chip seal overlay. We have the protective coatings that will go on there. Um, for the ducts itself, uh, we did not put, uh, they have duct couplers and post-tension bridges. We did not use those, uh, but we, we have uh, you know, we checked for leakage at all of, the, all of the duct locations. So those are some of the things. So the, the stainless steel bar is a, is a big one. <laughs> the preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.